Greetings, travelers. I am Merlin. Welcome to the Lost Continent. The real mystery to us is how a continent this exciting ever got lost. Universal Studios recently announced that Dragon Challenge would be leaving Islands of Adventure in September of 2017. This is sad news to fans of the original ride. Dragon Challenge, or Dueling Dragons, has a rich history, much like many of the other rides at Universal Orlando Resort. And this video is meant to explain its long and drama-filled story. In order to understand this unique piece of Universal history, we must first look at the history of another Orlando theme park, Animal Kingdom. The planning and construction of Animal Kingdom began in 1990. The first concepts for Islands of Adventure were being drawn up around this time as well. Animal Kingdom was one of Michael Eisner's projects that he attempted to bring to life. The original idea for Animal Kingdom was that it was going to showcase all animals, and by all, I mean living, extinct, and even mythical. When we look at Animal Kingdom today, we can see that this goal was finally realized. There are many examples of real animals throughout the park. There's a section dedicated to extinct dinosaurs, and they now have their mythical creatures, if you count expensive blue people. But in the 1990s, the original plan for the mythical area of the park was not to house overrated James Cameron ideas. Originally, the area was going to be called Beastly Kingdom, and it was going to be divided into two parts, good mythical creatures and evil mythical creatures. Now, there are many other articles on the web which document Beastly Kingdom, so for the purpose of this video, we will be focusing specifically on the evil mythological creatures and their section. The realm of evil creatures was to contain a major attraction called the Dragon's Tower. As guests entered the tower, they would see the charred remains of knights who tried to take on the dragons, much like the original Dueling Dragons queue. At some point in the line, the guests would come across some bats who wanted to take the guests with them while they took some treasure away from the dragon. According to Jim Corgus, a Disney historian, guests would be aboard a suspended inverted roller coaster to create the feeling of flying along with the bats on the heist. A climactic confrontation with the dragon would have left the guests feeling the heat as its fiery breath came much too close. So, why wasn't it built? The main reason is that there was apparently a large budget cut in 1994. There's a rumor that Michael Eisner had to choose between two Animal Kingdom projects, Dinoland USA or Beastly Kingdom. I'll give you a hint as to which one he considered to be his pet project. Hi, welcome to Dinoland USA where you get to travel back millions of years, back when Ricky loved Lucy. That's right, Drew Carey. Dinoland USA was greenlit, while Beastly Kingdom was given the boot. Imagineer Joe Rohde didn't want to believe that Beastly Kingdom was dead. He had always hoped that it would be part of a Phase 2 expansion, meaning that it would open shortly after the rest of the park. When Animal Kingdom opened in 1998, McDonald's released promotional toys for Animal Kingdom in their kids' meals. The kids' meals boxes still contained pictures of the dragon encountering the Discovery Riverboat and there was still a toy dragon that could be collected. Animal Kingdom's logo even contains a dragon silhouette. So it seemed as if some hope for Beastly Kingdom still remained. Camp Minnie and Mickey, which took the place of Beastly Kingdom, was also looked at by many as temporary. But according to Orlando Business Journal in 2000, Joe Rohde said, we had a vision and now it's become a placeholder. We have all kinds of ideas, and not all of them fit the theme of Beastly Kingdom. I'm not even convinced there will be a Beastly Kingdom. This is especially true now, considering the fact that Disney has spent six years and millions of dollars to bring the world of Avatar to Animal Kingdom. Pandora is now located where Beastly Kingdom was originally meant to go. While dragons and unicorns do not have their own domain at Animal Kingdom, they can still be seen around the park in certain areas. One of the parking lot sections is called Unicorn, and there's still a massive dragon head over the ticket booth area in front of the park. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, what does any of this have to do with Islands of Adventure? As I said earlier, Animal Kingdom and Islands of Adventure were being developed around the same time. It is speculated by many that after the budget cuts at Animal Kingdom, some Imagineers took their talents somewhere else, but not somewhere far. 
The timeline of Islands of Adventure's construction is important in understanding the possible drama. In the early 90s, Universal knew it wanted the new park to have three areas, one based on comic book characters, one based on cartoon characters, and one based on Dr. Seuss's books. By 1993, Islands of Adventure had a new addition, which was Jurassic Park. Now, skipping a few years, in 1997, Universal Studios opened an exhibit across from Kong Frontation, which showed the concepts for the new theme park, including all six islands, Seuss Landing, Marvel Superhero Island, Toon Lagoon, Jurassic Park, and the Lost Continent. So, between 1993 and 1997, another island was added. If Imagineers from Animal Kingdom left around the same time as the budget cuts in 1994, they would have been able to bring their beastly ideas over to Islands of Adventure while it was still being developed. May 28, 1999, Islands of Adventure opened to the public, and with it, Dueling Dragons. Dueling Dragons is one of Islands of Adventure's original attractions, and it is only the third to leave the park, the first two being the Island Skipper Tours and Triceratops Encounter. So, what did Dueling Dragons look like in its prime? Well, when guests approached the ride, they were confronted by two absolutely massive dragons, one blue and one red. If you stood in the right place, you could see one of the close proximity passes of the ride in between the two dragons. As you walked past the dragons and worked your way through Merlinwood, you would get closer to the castle with the dragons battling very close to you on one side of the trail. There would be villagers' signs which warned you of the dragons, but you would continue to the castle. Once in the castle, guests would see an enchanted stained glass window which explained the story of the dragons. This was made by Pixel Factory in Orlando. After this section, guests would walk around Merlin's spell book, which was propped up on a pedestal. The spells in the book were directly aimed at the two dragons plaguing the castle. The next room the guests walked through was lined with the remains of knights who went against the fire dragon. Around each victim was a poem describing how they died. After going past the fire victims, guests would see frozen knights in the rafters of the castle illuminated only by candlelight. I would like to take a moment and just say that one of my most vivid memories of this ride was the Ice Dragon's victims. It was surprisingly eerie. Now going along, guests also passed by a giant door which seemed as if it could cave in at any moment. The sound of dragons breathing could be heard just behind it. The catacombs came after this. They were extremely dark and decorated with bones with bad puns on the wall. After the rather long catacombs, guests would be confronted with the decision to ride the fire or ice dragon, or as the ride put it, to choose thy fate. I would like to pause again and just say that I've been on this ride quite a few times, even back when it was more popular and it was still called Dueling Dragons, and I never remember the line stretching farther than the catacombs. The line was absolutely colossal. Catherine A. Jean was the creative director slash field art director of the ride, and when questioned about the length of the queue, she said, The Universal Operations Group of that time had done calculations that led them to believe that that would actually be needed. The suspended steel coasters and their tracks were built by B&M, and their holes, which were created to look like dragons, were created by Kern Sculpture Gallery. Originally, the coasters would race each other. In order to achieve the signature close proximity passes, high-tech equipment had to be applied. On the lift mechanism itself, there are load cells there that weigh each train. It decides if one is heavier than the other and will go faster than the other, and holds them and times them so that they go off the lift separated at the appropriate time, in order to meet properly on the loop. Each roller coaster was unique and smooth. There was little scenery once on the ride, but Catherine A. Jean says, if you look closely, we made some scrapes on the exterior stone of the castle wall as though some contact had already previously been made with the stone. At this time, it was unique and fresh for a roller coaster to be so story-driven. The narrative of the story almost went deeper. In early development, there was supposed to be a scene in the queue in which guests would enter a chamber and see treasure. Soon after, silhouettes of the dragons would appear. This was one of the few ideas that was dropped. So. What changed when the Wizarding World took over this area? The ride itself is the same, except for the fact that the rides no longer leave at the same time to achieve the close proximity passes. 
This was done for safety. According to the Orlando Sentinel, the coasters no longer dueled because of two incidents in the summer of 2011. The worst incident happened to a 52-year-old man who was hit in the eye by some loose article and ultimately had to have the eye surgically removed. These were the first injuries of their kind on this ride, and because of this, the coasters no longer duel. Now, they have implemented metal detectors at the very front of Dragon Challenge and Hulk. What else has changed? Many guests were relieved to hear that the ride would be staying even though Harry Potter would be moving into this area of the Lost Continent. The queue was still heavily themed, although this time, the story parallels Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire instead of an original story about Merlin and dragons. The entrance is no longer grand and, to be quite honest, it's easy to miss. Although, if you look closely, the golden egg from the film can be seen at the top of the entrance. Once guests enter the forest, they can see Triwizard Tournament signs as well as the Weasley's car in the woods. Guests enter the castle through the champion's tent. Going a bit further, the Triwizard Cup now sits where Merlin's book once sat. How dare you stand where he stood? The giant door with the creepy dragon sounds is still intact, but after this, the theming pretty much ends. The tunnels are dark and completely absent of the death that used to decorate the walls. At the end, guests are given the option of riding the Chinese fireball to the left or the Hungarian horntail to the right. Why it's leaving? The most obvious answer is space. Dueling Dragons is a massive ride with a massive queue. I think it's also worth noting that every time I've been to Universal in the past year, the line has not exceeded 15 minutes. This may be because some people consider the locker and metal detectors to be a hassle when trying to get on the ride. While it's an extremely fun ride, and I will be sad to see it go, I'm also excited to see what Universal can do with all that space. We know that the attraction will be Harry Potter themed, which makes sense because each Harry Potter expansion has brought a ton of guests to the park, and the location of this ride is right next to Hogsmeade. While its end is drawing near, I do take some comfort in the idea that Universal usually honors the rides that are replaced. Kong can be seen in The Mummy in the Treasure Room, Doc has a cameo in The Simpsons Ride, and there are a few Jaws Easter eggs in Diagon Alley. So keep your eyes peeled when the new attraction opens up to any references to a dragon of fire or ice. If you liked this video, there are plenty of people who make content like this on a regular basis. Defunctland covers the history of rides and attractions that no longer exist. Bright Sun Films covers the history on rides that are now extinct or abandoned, also just locations that are abandoned. Uh, he does a great job when talking about past Disney attractions, and a few Universal attractions as well. And if you're looking for updates on what's happening at Islands of Adventure and the Dragon Challenge area, you can always keep your eye on The Tim Tracker and his YouTube channel. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I hope that you get a chance to ride Dragon Challenge before it's extinct.